the, those people that are hosting meetings, perhaps, yeah, appreciate that. Or you're more than welcome to join the session, you know, no problems at all there. Okay, so today's session is around multi-stakeholder partnerships to deliver on greenhouse gas mitigation and our climate change adaptation. So just to frame the discussion, when we consider partnerships, we know that there's SDG 17, we know that there's a lot of calls for collaborations, the types of collaborations that might be non-traditional, they might require unconventional partnerships, they might even be those types of collaborations that are not sort of natural for competitors to all work together in one room. But it's exactly these kinds of partnerships that we need if we are going to be, uh, if we are going to decarbonise and indeed be more resilient and adaptive to climate change. So in this session today, I would like to introduce our panellists who are going to share their experiences on working through partnerships, sharing how partnerships are formed, what's the drivers for these partnerships, what are the shared visions that are needed, what are the motivations, how are these partnerships governed, who's a member, who pays, are they paying out, paying in, and, and what happens in terms of you know, how decisions are made within complex multi-stakeholder partnerships. And then lastly, we have this question on keeping it real. How are these partnerships accountable? What measures do they use and what frameworks are they using to make sure that their aspirations and ambitions are indeed delivering the types of mitigation and adaptation outcomes that the partnership has set out to achieve? So I'll just do a brief introduction and we are live streaming. So. Um, to those people joining us, um, we're most grateful and we'll make sure that we do uh, uh, slow things down a little bit so that people joining online uh, can participate as well. So first of all, I'd like to welcome to our panel uh, Josh Harris. Uh, people know Josh because he's the Director of Communications at the We Mean Business Coalition. We have uh, at the end, John, John Nile, who, who is the head of Forest and Carbon with Salesforce. And uh, John, this is your second time on a Jeff panel, so <laughs> thank you so much uh, for, for joining us today. And uh, next to John, we have Alice Daniela Torres, who is the City Business Engagement Manager with ICLEI. We're really pleased to have uh, Scarlett Benson, who wears many hats, but today, but today is wearing the hat of um, in her role as the lead on Beyond Value Chain Mitigation with the Science Based Targets Initiative. Um, Karen Wang, who is the Youth Ambassador for GOLC. So GOLC, for those people joining online, is the Global Alliance for Universities on Climate. So we're delighted to have youth participation in our panel today. And of course, last, but no, by no means least, uh, Stefania Avanzini, who is the Director of OP2B. If you don't know what OP2B means, you have to wait for Stefania um, to explain. So I'm going to kick off this first part of the panel discussion by thinking about the genesis of partnerships. What is bringing partners together? What's the drivers? What's the motivation? So We Mean Business is one of the biggest coalitions out there. So Josh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the drivers and the membership of We Mean Business. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so yes, uh, I'm Josh Harris, the Director of Communications at We Mean Business. Um, I joined just over a year ago, just ahead of COP26, um, and I was warned by one of my new colleagues that it would take me at least a year to really understand how We Mean Business works and the complexities of such a, uh, such a, a large uh, and complex and historic multi-stakeholder partnership. Um, and I think that I think that 12 month mark is, is is about right. I feel like I finally got a handle on on all the nuances. Um, so we mean business is a coalition of of business organisations. Um, I'll just run through this. We mean it's uh, WBCSD, uh, CDP, Climate Group, uh, BSR, um, the B Team, CDP, and uh, CLG. 
So these are um, seven very different organizations, each of which has its own um, complexities and, and its own um, um, ways of working. Some are, member, some are membership organizations, um, some, are, some are organizations that charge uh, businesses to be members of them. Others are much smaller kind of coalitions working mostly with leaders. Others are uh, coming very much from a kind of academic background in the case of, of the Cam Cambridge Institute. So seven really quite different organizations. Um, and amongst those, they each work with hundreds and in some cases thousands of their own uh, member uh, businesses and partner businesses. So the, the, the kind of pond that we're swimming in is very, very large indeed. Um, and the genesis of, of the coalition came about ahead of the, um, the Paris climate negotiation, so COP15, uh, uh, sorry, COP21, um, where there was a feeling that all of these different organizations were, um, had the same ambition, but weren't necessarily speaking with a single voice. And particularly the businesses within those organizations uh, were not speaking with a, a united voice. And so um, the ambition with setting up the coalition was to, to come to Paris with a, a single set of very clear policy asks, which could be put on the table in front of negotiators. I remember this was before really um, non-state actors had a, a formal role within the COP negotiations. So business was able to come and say, right, this is what we want. This is what we need negotiators to come up with uh, from the Paris Agreement, which you know didn't exist at the time, um, in order for business to really accelerate the climate action that they wanted to see. Um, and in that, in that respect, it was, it was very successful and, and many of the asks that they were looking for were features of the Paris Agreement. Um, and we've really kind of looked to build on that uh, ever since. Um, I, and I mean, one of the questions that, um, that, that Matthew posed ahead of time was, was about the importance of, um, you know, is it about individuals? Is it about the system? Is it structural? I think what is worth noting about We Mean Business is the importance of, of all of those kind of systemic factors, but also a single charismatic individual. So uh, Steve Howard, who was the um, director of sustainability at IKEA at the time, he was the individual who saw the gap. You know, I, I think um, many of these partnerships come about because somebody identifies a gap in the market. If, um, if you don't see the gap in the market, then it's quite likely you're duplicating something that already exists. Uh, but in this case, he saw the gap in the market. He had the credibility as a business leader himself. Um, he was able to unlock finance through the IKEA Foundation. Um, and then, you know, it, things move very quickly once everybody saw the vision and, and recognized the opportunity. So, you know, I think it is that combination of structural need, but also visionary leadership. Yeah, that, that's fantastic, Josh. And I think, you know, so often it needs somebody to put themselves out there to, to be a leader and and to bring others along along with them. And, and Steve Howard, of course, now with Temasek uh, Gen Zero. Um, Stefania, OP2B, first of all, tell us what OP2B is, and then you know, perhaps you could also reflect on this leadership. How did OP2B start? Thank you. Yes, so hello everyone. I'm Stefania Mancini. I lead a coalition called One Planet Business for Biodiversity. So we are a action-oriented international cross-sector coalition of companies that have taken strong commitments to transform the way they source their ingredients in agriculture and uh, so really to transform the agricultural system. All these coali this coalition was born out of the conviction and probably scaling regenerative agricultural practices and restoring high-value ecosystems is the, the best way forward to reverse nature loss by 2030. And important also to note, this is a coalition who is hosted by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development that is part of the Women, uh, Women Business Coalition, so that we then connect the dots. Um, uh, important to know, I think it's interesting what you were saying is also OP2B was born out of a leadership. So it was a CEO leader, it was the, the CEO of Danone at that time, Emmanuel Faber, who actually recognized, well, our soils are polluted, our soils are undernourished, we actually need to set up a, a coalition that restores biodiversity in and off the field. This is so important really for, the, for our business. So the, the purpose, this, is, uh, this, this was the, the gap that was identified and it's about a, a CEO leader who really uh, managed to assemble around him a cross-sector coalition. So I have food, the major food companies, textile companies and cosmetic companies. Because whenever you 
think about transforming agriculture at landscape level. For example, it, offer, it uh, requires crop rotations or intercropping, and so you need different companies to, to invest in these projects. And so this is how OP2B uh, came about. And um, maybe interesting to note that the first step that the coalition took is, okay, but what change do we want to see? How do we want to measure success? And so the first thing that the coalition did three years ago when it started was, okay, we are all talking about regenerative agriculture. What are the outcome indicators that we want to measure to measure the success? And, and for them, it was also important. This is our level playing field. We need to align as an industry, across industry, what this is about to be able then to collectively invest in it in the transformation. So the alignment step was the most important one. Uh, and, and we published in 2021 a regenerative agricultural framework that sets at the moment eight outcomes indicator, quite high level. But that all, all those, I have 26 multinational companies that are members today and they all agreed upon. So this is the first step, alignment. And I'll tell you more about the, the collective action and the investments later that we're driving. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Stefania. And I think we've heard a little bit about the private sector side. And I know, I know, I know uh, you know, ICLI is traditionally thought as, as public sector, but you're working on the interface between the business and the public sector side. So I wonder if you could, you know, just perhaps elaborate a little bit What's that challenge like, working with the public sector and the private sector? Because I think this is something that's a little bit unique to, to ICLI. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Matthew. So for, first of all, probably it's important to, to let you know a little about ICLI, where, where, where I am representing uh, today. So ICLI, uh, we are a city network uh, operating in global city network. We are around 3,000 cities across the globe, representing 125 countries around the globe. So we have um, we, our members are the cities, and we work and we strive and help them to advance their sustainability journey. So, um, of course, in, in this in this process, we have seen that uh, working with with the cities is not only working with uh, the local government per se; it's working with all the stakeholders and actors on a on a city level. So also uh, it's important to know that we work in, in, how can I say, in different levels of, of, of work uh, with cities. Of course, working with the public sector also involves working with local, uh, sorry, with regional governments, uh, provincial governments, but also working on a national level when we talk about sustainability. Um, we also strive for um, helping our cities in advancing on the circular development, on a low carbon development that brings us today here at COP nature-based solutions, uh, nature-based development, and also resilient and equitable development. So in this context, of course, cities need partnerships. They cannot do it uh, alone. And also in, in ICLE, um, uh, also us, as, as, uh, as a city network, we even partner between cities in order to drive different projects um, uh, around. So we work with, as I said before, with uh, on a multi-level governance uh, process with regional governments, national governments. We also work work with, with other entities of the public sector, like for example, energy companies, for example, that are also publicly owned or private owned, depending on the, on the project that we are working. We also work with the financial sector. We also work with the different uh, banks uh, or financial institutions to help broad cities advancing in their journey. Uh, and then, of course, with the private sector in all the projects that we do for, for example, uh, uh, projects of developing infrastructure, any type of infrastructure, of course, at the end, the private sector are the ones that implement the things in the field, no? Uh, and then also, uh, when we talk about partnerships, we don't have to forget the civil society also, the uh, non-governmental organizations, citizens' organizations that are, uh, how can I say, the voice of, of, of cities uh, on society sustainability and also believe it or not we also work with academic and research organizations because when we talk about climate action we think that we have to be in science uh, forward in order to help cities advance in their decision making processes we have heard that cities want to be carbon neutral they want to be resilient but this has to be said based on science this cannot be made only as a political say or something so we support cities also in providing the technical support for them to make better decisions based on science so 
we have a lot of um, partners where we work and happy to uh, later share more experiences on that. Thank you, Alice, Daniela. That's very insightful. Now, cities, you know, we've talked about leadership. Emmanuel Faber, we've talked about leadership. Um, Steve Howard and, and, and others in, in perhaps also WBCC. What about leadership in ICLEI? How, how do you manage some of these political challenges of, you know, mayors and, and, and so on? What, what, what happens there? Yeah, well, I think that, uh, first of all, as I said, ICLE, we are a, a network of cities. So our members are the cities. So we have a, a Rexcom, we have an executive committee which cities come and, and help us design the strategy that we want to, to work with our cities. Of course, it's, it's challenging, but at the same time, it's, um, it's very good to have cities in our board so we can decide together what are their priorities. Okay, and of course, then when you work on a on a city level, we work with mayors, eh, but we also hope we also work with the technical staff. No, so it's a combination of work. But we have seen from experience that um, the cities that want to be more ambitious or or advance faster, they always have the political and high level commitment, and the mayor is always um, leading these. No, so uh, this afternoon I was on another session, and for example, we had the mayor of Turku in Finland. So so when you hear her, she's really inspiring uh, what, uh, to others to listen. And I think that when you hear her, you really believe that what the city is doing is true. So yeah, so just that. Uh, so it's uh, interesting to work also with the mayors. You have some crazy mayors too, but, but all fine. I know this is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, marvelous. Now, um, Alice, Daniela, you mentioned the academic institutions and of course universities are generally a, a big part of a, of a sort of city infrastructure, bringing the young people and, and academics and research together. I perhaps wonder now if we can turn to Karen and you can tell us a little bit perhaps about what the universities are doing and especially in this very important context of youth. So uh, for those people joining online, you've never seen youth more represented at a COP than here. Uh, just one building over there's the Youth Pavilion. Easily, it's the most active, dynamic pavilion in, in the entire COP. So it's a really important development that we're seeing uh, here at COP27. So perhaps, Karen, you can reflect on the youth statement that was made and the objectives of golf. Tell us what golf is. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm here to increase a little bit of the energy level. I think it's uh, halfway through. So my name is Karen. Uh, so today I'm here to represent GOG. Uh, the full name is Global Youth Ambassador, uh, no, <laughs> it's a Global Alliance of a University on Climate. Uh, so it's a, uh, we're not new, so it's an alliance led by Tsinghua University from China, but we have several other top universities like Imperial, where I'm from, uh, and also like uh, we have like Science Pool uh, and Oxford and then like MIT, different universities. Uh, so what we bring this year, uh, so if you have been here yesterday at China Pavilion, we have a day long, uh, the day before yesterday, so the GOG event. The goal is really, as Matthew just mentioned, in climate, there's no shortage of young people. Uh, this is really interesting uh, topic because um, I mean, Greta kicked off we, we, our focus on what young people's role in this climate discussions. We are living in such a complicated world. Like, I mean, everything's ended with a crisis right now. It's like food crisis, water crisis. I mean, we have food crisis at COP. Uh, it's hard to find food, right? And, uh, but, you know, like, as slightly younger generations come into this field, uh, and then our ambassadors, like this year, we bring 15-ish uh, students coming to Cobb, we have half of them are PhD students in uh, environment, in uh, science, engineer, uh, and everyone comes to climate topic. For me, it's just new types of partnership. I mean, we talk about partnership with business, uh, with private public sector, uh, and but I, I want to like um, specifically mention about like the GOG way of partnership. Uh, so the first thing is I think the role. Uh, so apparently, there's the climate issue is not really created by us, um, but it's like kind of problem, it's gonna be solved by the youth, uh, which is kind of, uh, I think, challenge, but also opportunity, I would take it as. Uh, and then second thing is uh, the partnership with 
nature. Uh, so our topic today is uh, mitigation and adaptation. Uh, sometimes we're focusing on too much on technology, but usually we forget about nature. Uh, and nature-based solution is becoming a more and more like importance. So my background is climate finance, so we're looking to like carbon market, for example, like trees and then carbon. Uh, and there's a gentleman over there is going to talk about it. Uh, but nature is such a. Uh, it's just like like you know like if we look at the planet, 70% of the planet is ocean, uh, which is a natural carbon sink not proper for living. Uh, if we really do the statistic, the land we're able to live, it's really tiny piece. And this is like the dri sorry, driving force of all the emission. Uh, so it's a small problem, but it's also a giant problem. Like how to reduce the carbon, remove the carbon uh, with that little bit of land created. Uh, so how to appreciate more about nature, like how to compensate on nature and then create economy models that we can have bring more, especially private sector capitals into uh, economies, especially imaging economies, will be important agenda. I was in the session of loss and damage earlier uh, with hearing all the countries talking about how to bring more investment into nature, uh, but still we don't have an answer on the uh, voluntary carbon market yet. Even last year we discussed about the Paris Agreement. Um, so I think this is new type of partnership, like as I mean, my angle looking to it, like how we can really solve the problem. Uh, like we need everyone purely, but uh, in the end, I think partnership is not about, uh, it's not just about speaking the same language. Of course, we're not going to speak the same language. Uh, it's about building a common ground uh, with all different sectors and all different languages. Uh, and then everyone puts, I mean, the, your, your strengths and then to build a way like to, uh, there will be uh, compromise. Uh, but I think the, the benefit uh, of that little bit of compromise is just really to uh, take care of the environment for human being. It's not climate issues, not about taking care of the earth, it's about us. Uh, especially, I believe like the panelists might have children already, uh, not us. Um, but I mean, it's, it's a world for uh, younger generations. You want them to have good food. You want them to like do not have food water crisis on COP. Uh, and yeah, so, so I wanted to conclu conclude this with uh, GOC mission. So uh, we have an open letter, uh, which I'll share with everyone later. Uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of like putting up together different voices. Uh, so from our ambassadors all over the world, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, not all of them can come to COP this year. Uh, but I think like having this platform to speak uh, and then to get our voice be listened. Uh, in fact, like uh, President Macron uh, just uh, received a letter and then give really high uh, like words to, to this. And we are targeting to send it to more people, uh, to the decision makers, really high level uh, administration uh, and then like ministers. Um, so this is something that you definitely do not want to miss. Uh, and uh, I think like it's just a really important topic, bring every sector together. Uh, I think it's, it's actually pretty, so uh, la one, last, uh, one last interesting question I want to mention. Um, so uh, it might be new like to having a uh, young age, uh, sort of uh, nobody like sitting here to discuss this topic. Uh, but I was on another event several days ago. Uh, it's called MISC Forum. Uh, so you repeat that, please? What's it called? MISC. Uh, it's in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but it was a really cool uh, forum. It's kind of like COP, but for young people. The really funny factor of MISC is the city where MISC is hosted, 77% of the population is under 30. So I uh, think like, I mean, we have lots of crisis. Uh, climate is like kind of bringing everything together, um, but it is um, younger individuals, groups, uh, who's gonna sit in on the important positions other, as other panels uh, they are today. Uh, so I think like, hope this can bring it up to the discussion for the panel today. Karen, thank you. thank you so much for bringing that youth perspective. And also in the Jeff Pavilion, mentioning the importance of nature, that's a very welcome message for us as well. And I think this, this you know, there's a few themes coming out now. This question of alignment, alignment with the Paris goals, alignment between industries, as you mentioned, this word common ground. Uh, and I think that's a, a really nice way of putting it to, to foster partnerships. On this subject of nature and technology, John, if, if we could turn to Salesforce, I mean, Salesforce and nature, that's not something that people immediately put 
side by side. So tell us about what Salesforce is doing and the types of innovative partnerships that you are leading. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to meet all the panelists after this. And Matthew, thanks for facilitating. Um, yeah, we're a software, we're a tech company. And um, I think a lot of our leadership comes from both the top and the bottom. Our CEO, our CEO is very passionate about um, ecopreneurs and supporting ecopreneurs and uh, nature-based solutions, uh, making sure the carbon market can work. Um, and one of the partnerships that was kind of led from him along with the World Economic Forum is a, a wonderful platform called OneT.org. Um, and uh, when humans first started really growing and expanding, um, we had about six trillion trees on Earth. And right now we have three trillion trees on Earth. So um, a group of people came together and decided to put it at the World Economic Forum. Um, just the idea that we should grow a trillion trees this decade of ecosystem restoration. And that's been a fabulous partnership. It kind of sits inside and alongside some of the carbon markets, but it also allows us to bring philanthropy, um, to hold ourselves accountable to certain metrics. So Salesforce has committed to, um, we, we, we created a $100 million climate justice and ecosystem restoration fund. And that's to support 100 million trees that are done the right way, by the right people, for the right reason. Um, and that's a, just a, a fantastic partnership that is also, we're really seeing youth and indigenous led. Um, so that brings me to, I guess, another type of partnership which we've done, which is um, we also have to scale these solutions. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of innovation and we really need to get mitigation and adaptation to scale. And one of the most uh, exciting partnerships I think that's been happening that we're, we're a proud member of is a, a partnership called LEAF, which is, um, the largest public-private partnership to scale climate solutions to jurisdictions uh, by conserving and restoring their forests. Um, I guess I also just was kind of reflecting, like, the UNFCCC is itself a partnership. You know, like, the largest source of consensus in human history, based on the most transparent scientific process that humans have ever run, the IPCC. And we've really seen the youth and um, the business community, and we've like seen the, the Triple C grow from a purely party-driven process to, I think, what we're seeing now at the COPS is really uh, pavilions and hub-based and really solution-based. And um, I haven't heard of a single one that is not a partnership. <laughs> so um, I think it just speaks to the importance of this topic, and um, it definitely seems like that's where things are going, Matthew. That, that's brilliant, John, the leadership from the top and supporting these eco-entrepreneurs. Eco You're also working in the ocean space. You know, trillion trees, the terrestrial work, but the blue carbon work and oceans. I mean, this is something that you've just started recently, I know. But I think the mix of partners, tell us about the mix of partners you've got working in that arena. You know, like uh, all partnerships, they're... they're it, there's a whole range of wonderful ones, and Salesforce is actually not playing a very big role. We're kind of like trying to connect some of the dots, but you can imagine before the Paris Agreement, oceans were not part of this process, even though they're the largest sink and they're the ecosystem that's probably being damaged the most for the longest period of time with acidification and warming. So we're really trying to play a facilitating role. One of the things we did work um, with a whole bunch of much smarter organizations than ourselves um, was just to pull together like what are the core principles for blue carbon projects and investments. Um, and that's something that we've released here at COP. Um, we're also partnering with another company, um, Netflix. Um, and what we're trying to do there is think a lot of the, there's not very many high quality blue carbon projects right now, even though there's a massive need. Um, so we're trying to see if we can put some philanthropic or potentially carbon credit finances that's like very patient so we know we need to build capacity. We know ne we need to sort of help kind of stand up these blue carbon projects worldwide. Um, so we're doing what's called like a request for information where we're just trying to listen to who's out there and then ask what kind of helpful role uh, tech companies could play. Um, so we're kind of in that listening stage right now, which I think is a good place to start a partnership, so. Yeah. And, the, and the reach that Salesforce and Netflix has is just probably unsurpassed, right, in, in reaching the audience. So that's marvellous, John. And, you know, we need metrics, we need 
robust accounting systems. And I'd like now to ask, you know, Scarlett Benson, who has many hats, but is, is here now on the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Why did the Science-Based Targets Initiative start? And, you know, where are you going with this initiative? Yeah, so it started uh, in 2015 ahead of um, COP21, um, where there was a sort of recognition that business, you know, the Paris Agreement was about to be sort of signed and businesses really wanted to play their part. So it was, it was definitely demand-led. There were a couple of leading businesses that said that we want to have our equivalent of Paris and what does it look like. Um, and so it is a partnership between WWF uh, CDP, the World Resources Institute, the UN Global Compact, and more, most recently, We Mean Business Coalition. Um, and essentially, um, what it does is it, it, it creates standards for companies in different sectors to align their, their business strategies with climate science. So, for example, they have the net zero standard, which says, if you're a company in this sector, this is how much you need to reduce your emissions by X date. And these are the kind of rules around what you need to report on, etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah, why, why did it start? I mean, I think maybe also just a comment on how sort of successful it's been. And maybe just I'm a month in to my time at, C at SVTI. But um, there are 4,000 companies in the world as of today um, that have committed to science-based targets. Uh, l this time last year, it was 2,000. And at that point... Um, that re those 2,000 represented a quarter of the world's market capitalization. We don't have the numbers quite yet. We're wor working them out for this year's progress report, but we have significant amount of the world's emissions covered by science-based based targets and a significant, you know, very large company is involved. Um, so it's clearly been a sort of successful partnership between these NGOs and also with um, the many other partners that are involved in the process because um, every Every standard, so they develop sectoral standards, will have an expert advisory group. So a group of consultants, businesses, academics, um, experts essentially that are advising the SBTI on what is the science, what is needed, what is feasible for businesses, implementable, um, so that the, these standards essentially are aligned with climate science, rigorous, um, high integrity, but also the businesses can actually implement them. So I very much see SBTI not as just a partnership between the NGOs that are involved in making the standards, but the much broader network, scientists that are feeding into it, as well as the businesses, the 4,000 businesses that have engaged with it. Um, and you mentioned other hats. We're now kind of in the very exciting phase where we're um, initiating this, well, the Science-Based Target Network, which is actually trying to apply the same concept of, as Science-Based Targets for Climate, we're looking at other nature systems, earth systems, so freshwater, um, biodiversity, pollution, etc. So um, the, the, the model of SBTI was seen as very successful, and now the Science-Based Target Network is bringing in more NGOs. It's got Conservation International involved, TNC, you know, all of the very large NGOs are involved in it. So um, I think it's a model that's clearly been successful because it's being replicated. It's, it's a fantastic model. And I think the question, the question in my mind when I think about science-based targets is, you know, you'll always get different views from different scientists. You know, in the IPCC, there are uh, statements that then require a certain degree of consensus opinion. You know, uh, a broad agreement, partial agreement, you know, strong agreement and whether this is a, a clear or um, a, a, a likely outcome. You know, there's, there's a degree of certainty and, a degree of, and, a, and then a degree of agreement. Yeah. So how do you navigate that with, with your science-based targets initiative? Yeah, so, um, well, the IPCC defines many different pathways to net zero. You could, as a planet, we could do nothing and we could just buy, you know, have loads of removals in 2050. Obviously, that wouldn't work because they're too expensive and the te technology doesn't exist today. But um, it's a pathway that if we could magically invent technology that might work. Um, I'm not proposing that one. Um, whereas they also have these pathways where we 
rapidly decarbonize um, today. Um, we rely less heavily on removals, which means that we have um, you know, less trade-offs in terms of food security and land use. And so the SBTI has chosen to kind of define its net zero standard in line with that safer pathway that is more kind of just in that it um, you know, ensures food security. It also doesn't push the burden onto future generations. So, um, you know, they have selected essentially the pathways that are safest for humanity, um, where there is a pretty good kind of agreement within the scientific community. Um, now, of course, there are many areas where there isn't like cons consensus, and I think um, th that that's how, that's why governance and decision-making processes are so critical in these coalitions, because you might have. Um, you know, a disagreement about the potential role of certain technologies or, and as you need to have an agreed process for how you make decisions. And if you cannot find consensus within the group, then who does it get escalated to? And, um, you know, and, and how do you seek advice from external experts in order to make a decision? So I think having, for all of these partnerships, like having that decision-making and governance process clear up front is absolutely critical. That's a fantastic point, so please we ask that question. Now, Josh, if we can turn to you, one of the largest business coalitions, one of the things that I really like about the We Mean Business Coalition is this concept of the ambition loop. People might not understand the ambition loop, so if you could explain a little bit about that, then how do you keep it real? How do you make that ambition actually something that you can report against and are you requiring your members to report or use SBTI? What disclosure frameworks are you requiring um, as part of a credible membership for a, for a great organisation like We Mean Business? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Matthew, and uh, thank you to the panel. It's been fascinating insights. Um, yeah, so the ambition loop, it's a fairly simple concept, really. Um, so the businesses to Paris, uh, ahead of the Paris Agreement, said we know what we need to do in order to cut our emissions, or we've got a good idea how to get there. But to, to really accelerate that and move at the pace which science is telling us we need to do, then we need the policy frameworks that will allow us to move at that speed. We need the removal of barriers, we need the removal of, um, of unhelpful subsidies for fossil fuels, you know, what it, whatever those policy barriers may be, um, businesses are quite clear on what those are. And then if, those, if policymakers are able to remove those barriers, more and more businesses are, can accelerate the implementation of their, uh, of their climate action, which then in turn makes it easier for uh, policymakers to, to, uh, in, in, to remove more barriers and to accelerate the, uh, well, to introduce the policies which then make it easier for businesses to do more. So it's a kind of mutually enforcing effort, whereas the more the businesses move, the easier, the, the bigger the political space for politicians to act, which then makes it easier for, for more businesses to come on board. And I think certainly, um, you know, I think the growth of We Mean Business has happened very much in parallel with SPTI, and that's why we're very delighted to, to kind of now be formal um, members of the board, because we increasingly recognize that the only way that, that you can kind of um, uh, deliver credible and um, meaningful emissions reductions is by having a standard that uh, your member, I mean, we're not, we're not actually a member's organization. We don't, um, some of our, our member organizations that, that so the, the, the founding members of the, the coalition themselves will have members, but we don't have any kind of subscription service. But, but the, the companies that we choose to work with and the, the companies such as Salesforce that we you know, we will do communications work with, we will do advocacy work with. Increasingly, we're saying, if you really want to walk the walk, then you need to have a science-based target. And there's a few different, you know, SPTI is, is the gold standard, but there are, you know, it's not the only, it's the, not the only game in town. We also um, have a project called um, the, the um, SME Climate Hub, which is uh, an effort to work with small businesses that, you know, just frankly don't have the sophistication and the, the bandwidth and the capacity to, to go through the process necessary um, for reporting to CDP or to, to um, um, aligning with SBTI. So how can they get on, one, on a 1.5 degree pathway in a much more simple way 
Um, and so in that sense, we're kind of able to see that, uh, uh, you know, we, we've now got an equivalent number and four, five, six thousand SMEs have signed up just in the past uh, two years, um, which, you know, I think is very exciting. And an interesting part of that is um, many of those are British companies because we collaborated with, uh, with the UK government in the build up to COP26. So when they were having small businesses coming to them saying, how can we be part of this activity around COP26? They were saying, well, you know, if you're big enough, then the gold standard is BTI. Um, if you're smaller, then go and go and see the folks uh, at the SME Climate Hub. And so that kind of collaboration across, you know, different organisations working with slightly different businesses, and then also with governments, um, you know, I think is is really important. Um, yeah, and I think ultimately, your kind of question about how do you how do you hold your members accountable. Um, I think everybody, particularly in the, the kind of the, the business climate action space, is is so conscious of this issue of greenwashing and um, the degree to which companies um, are making commitments that they may not be delivering on, and and that certain companies are um, riding on the coattails of those companies that actually really are delivering the really meaningful work. And so I think it, the, the pressure is on all of those organizations, such as We Business, such as WBCSD, such as SPTI, to constantly be putting pressure on our, the, the, the companies that we work with. But I also think there's uh, a role for us to play, and, and perhaps this is where We Mean Business has a particular uh, role, and that's to recognize just how challenging it is for businesses. You know, those that are out there and who are trying to do this, it's essentially trying to build the road, build the bridge, as you're trying to get to the destination. Um, and so sometimes things are going to go wrong. Sometimes it's going to be messy. Sometimes targets are going to be missed. And I think the, the narrative is often, particularly in the media, but also, you know, I think from certain politicians, that um, there's a sense that because those businesses that are talking about it aren't doing it in an absolutely perfect manner, they deserve criticism. Whereas we think there's actually a lot more to be criticized for those companies that are either not speaking out on this issue or are actively kind of using the cover of those of, of, um, of progressive businesses in order to get competitive edge and, and uh, essentially, you know, by be, being the more polluting option, um, undercutting those companies which are making progress. And so we feel like we have a responsibility to not only hold accountable those that are making progress, but also to call out those that aren't because they are, I would say, more of the problem than those companies that are trying to get this right and essentially trying to make it easier and cheaper for other companies that will come along in their wake. Uh, that, that's a great insight. Um, thank you very much, Josh, for that. So we're talking about disclosure frameworks. What about cities? How do cities disclose? They're accountable to the people. What disclosure frameworks do cities use? In, in their approaches. Yeah, so, so well, um, cities do, <laughs> they have to be accountable, yes or no, because you know the citizens will come to the mayor office to complain. <laughs> uh, but the thing is that uh, in ECLE, we partnered a couple of, of years ago together with CDP in order to bring forward the greatest and more centralized uh, reporting platform and disclosure, uh, climate disclosure and environmental disclosure for cities, which is called the CDP clay track. So as for companies, we have the CDP platform per se. For cities, we have the CDP clay track uh, platform, where cities all over the world report their uh, climate and environmental performance. So it's very interesting. Of course, this is a voluntary mechanism, a voluntary thing that for cities to do. But uh, we have seen that uh, every year that passes, cities report more and more, um, both mitigation and, and adaptation actions, but also, for example, the greenhouse emissions inventory of the cities is reported in, in CDP also. Uh, for example, all the governance that cities has, the, the, the goals, the mitigation and adaptation goals they have. If a city wants to be carbon neutral by 2050, they have to report, but also they have to say how they are going to meet that target. Um, also, in the last years, we have seen that cities are uh, reporting a little more on risks and vulnerabilities to climate change adaptation um, because, um, believe it or not, uh, the adaptation uh, component of, of climate action has been lagging behind 
in the last year. So before it was always mitigation and mitigation, but in the last, I don't know, probably three to four years, cities are starting to do um, risk assessment and vulnerability assessments. So we are getting more data on that uh, from the city. So yes, there's a platform. It's a publicly available platform where you can see the data and the information that cities uh, are reporting. Uh, and Daniela, are there any climate neutral cities? Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. Probably not that have met the target yet, but we have a very good examples and pioneers uh, cities that are striving to, for carbon neutrality. Uh, just also to let you know that ECLE will have a, a carbon neutrality framework also to help cities advance in that. That of course comes with uh, mitigation actions, full mitigation actions. Um, and we strive also for compensation only at the end of the chain of, of carbon management. So uh, this framework, of course, is aligned with, with science. We also um, foster cities to do science-based targets too, because uh, for long years we have seen that cities want to be carbon neutral, but we don't know how they are going to do it. So we are also encouraging cities to um, generate science-based target. We are also part of a specific working group within the science-based target initiative to help to establish the methodologies that cities could use uh, to develop their science-based targets. But cities are doing fine. It's challenging, of course, but uh, cities are doing fine. And I think that really helps the Jeff because in the Global Environment Facility, when we're funding cities, it's the data and the metrics that really drives you know, our investment decisions and the reporting on global environmental benefits, which of course includes for us biodiversity metrics as well as climate metrics. And I think the one plant for business and biodiversity is in an interesting space right now around your disclosure and, and what you're planning to do, Stefania. Perhaps you could elaborate on where the one planet for business and biodiversity is in this lead up to COP15. Thank you. Well, first, I, I would like to say that the, we also have a prerequisite to join the coalition. So that's the first thing. So every member, every, every company that wants to join the coalition has to have made strong, smart commitments, so measurable, uh, anchored in science about the way they want to transform the way they source the ingredients. Because as we are an action-oriented platform, uh, individual companies need to have made a commitment of transformation of investments in their, in their sourcing model to be able to join the coalition. And, and secondly, we are three years old, and so we are realizing now that we need to then start reporting. So this is something we're, we're starting to do because agricultural projects take time. And um, I'm talking here only about OP2B. So we are actually in the process of setting up um, a, a reporting framework for the coalition as a collective to see how they are advancing versus their targets they have set publicly and also versus the, how, how the coalition is actually helping them accelerate. Of course, uh, a parenthesis, as I'm part of WBCSD, WBCSD was a member-led, we, we have 230 multinational companies. We actually, uh, yeah, we, we, we measure the, the progress, the sustainability of uh, all our members every year, and we have membership requirements too, and actually report on them, of course, yearly. And I wanted to, um, to highlight maybe one thing, because you were asking about keeping it real. So how does the coalition work? Uh, so we're really a convener, and so, companies that, join, that are part of the coalition, for example, decide to collectively invest in a landscape project, for example, on a project of field crop rotation, uh, we, we're here to convene and to catalyze and to help set the project up. But of course, then the investments happen then on the ground. So I'm very happy in a month we're announcing an 8 million uh, euros investment in 16,000 acres in the north of France with a field crop rotation project with food uh, food manufacturers were off taking wheat, uh, beetroot and, and potato uh, and also then cosmetic manufacturers were off taking beetroot for alcohol. So that's a very concrete project. And maybe I wanted to highlight another one because very much linked, which is about rice within WBCSD. So we have the Sustainable Rice Landscape Initiative, which is a multi-stakeholder partnership to really find how can we identify blended blended finance instruments that can attract more investment in sustainable rice, rice landscapes. And here also, uh, thanks to, to the Jeff's support, the, the coalition is building a blended finance instrument. And so this is a concrete, keeping it real impact on the ground. What are these coalitions hel um, yeah, helping out? And even within, for example, these OP2B coalitions, there are going to be many multi-stakeholder partnerships on the ground 
because that's how they're driving it. So even though it's more a cross-sector coalition, when we're talking about, for example, working in France or in Rice, we're, 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 we're working with, of course, farmers' organizations on the ground, uh, uh, the, the governments, uh, the, the regions. So we actually need also the, the help of, of governments and, and on, of, of public support. And what you were highlighting before, of course, about the importance that today governments are, are, are not financing enough transitions for example, of the agricultural sector is also a very important point, and we need to help those uh, road road blockers be uh, be um, yeah be how would you say lifted. And I Thank think you. that's an important point. These partnerships within partnerships, and that's a, a complex way of managing these types of, of organisations. Karen, I know you're also a, a, a an entrepreneur and a person that's engaged in the finance sector as well, and I'm thinking that we're talking about voluntary disclosure here. Many universities have made commitments to be carbon neutral. Many university funds, the funding organisations, the investments that universities are making uh, often have requirements for zero fossil fuels or um, net zero type goals or plans to phase out. I wonder if you could reflect on some of the metrics or success factors or ESG approaches that you're seeing in finance and in the university sector? Yeah. Um, it's actually a really well articulated question like uh, from university view because uh, the endowment is a really important driving force to, to let uh, the capitals into more uh, sustainable projects or fitting into the so-called ESG. So some quick facts. Uh, so I'm from mainland China, uh, but I lived and worked in Hong Kong for eight years. So Hong Kong Stock Exchange is actually driving really, really hard on uh, disclosure of the ESG report. Uh, it gives the requirement of E and S, not for G, um, but basically company needs to write up the report every year. Uh, and, and another fact is, uh, for disclosure, I mean, it's, it's a surprise to, to learn today like SBTI is only three years old because uh, like, it has been there for, for a while and then uh, I can tell from my China experience. So a company in China is also starting to disclose uh, and the SBTI has been mentioned many times and I think like for, for nature as well, like coming up. Um, and from our observation, uh, so uh, my, my company, our startup, we work on the carbon accounting uh, software. So we're trying to make the accounting more digi digitalized uh, as a step one, because you can only manage what you can measure uh, as a philosophy. Uh, and from country-wise, so apparently like different country has different ways of disclose. Uh, and just China, like, uh, like the, we have uh, for carbon, emission sector like for different uh, industries we have like 24 different uh, framework that government issued uh, and of course that company also like for few iso and also like um, uh, like finance sector for example uh, PCAF. Uh, so those are like coming up but this is like really a little bit uh, cloud field like a couple years ago we don't have enough framework but now we have too many framework uh, for the disclosure um, but the category coming back to, uh, we call it MRV, so, so monitor verification. So this is in terms of the project level and also for the company level. Uh, I want to bring up the intersector of technology and then disclosure. I really like the, uh, our two speaker mentioned about the science driven and the fact driven. So we, we need this level of integrity uh, for disclosure. Uh, it's kind of like you take exams. Uh, if it's like cheating, then nobody will believe in you in the future. So no matter what kind of framework company follows, uh, one, it has to be consistent uh, so that you can compare with your history or like your same company's industry. Uh, and the second is uh, the in level of integrity, how you prove like you're right. Um, and I mean, this can be biased. This is not represent my, my uh, startup or uh, the research institution I'm working on. Uh, I think like menu based disclosure will always be biased uh, in terms of data inputs, um, but it's, it's not uh, rocket science. So we cannot force companies to spend much more efforts on the disclosure, like to produce smart meters and then to report the scope too. This is a little bit unaffordable, especially for SMEs. Uh, and those are like taking the huge portion of scope three uh, emission for uh, companies, for example, like Salesforce. Uh, so most of probably coming from the supply chain. So I think like the disclosure really 
uh, how to make it ec economic affordable. Uh, and then the second is like how to make it more science driven, like fact driven. Uh, so something we tried is to uh, like scope to connect to the uh, electricity bills and also like smart meters trying to read that instead of having human coming to input. Uh, and y you sort of build that data foundation and then you can fulfill with SBTI and then you can fulfill with other uh, frameworks. Uh, it, it can be based on uh, the same level of data. Uh, so I think like to bring in the angle of how can make more fact driven uh, disclosure is really how we can make a more accountable MRV uh, or disclosure and then that link to uh, that link to like ESG's integrity as well. Uh, so final thing I will mention is uh, it's also like a field to be built because uh, now a really big challenge is uh, we definitely want more people looking into invest in uh, the environment friendly asset or like a carbon asset. But the thing is the carbon asset accounting is not really fitted into the traditional finance accounting yet. Uh, I know like IFRS is talking about that. It's probably something coming up, uh, but not today. Yeah. So a simple example is like uh, it will be hard to find where we put the carbon asset on the balance sheet. Uh, in that way, it's kind of like discourage investors to looking into it. Uh, so I think something to be expected in the future is like one would definitely need disclosure, like accountable with integrity. And the second is like more wish like we can bring more technology to make it more efficient and affordable and uh, hopefully universal language. Uh, and then that will account for uh, the so associations uh, sitting on the panel uh, from different sectors to bring everyone together as a partnership. I think that's great, Karen, that you raised this question of technology and the potential for such ideas as zero trust networks where you know the disclosure is, is automatic and doesn't require manual systems and, and things of that nature and is real time. That's, a, that's another aspect. A lot of the disclosure is, you know, quite, quite dated. And, you know, a company like Salesforce, you're on the cutting edge. You know, you're investing in these new blue carbon initiatives, the forest initiatives where sometimes things can be a bit fuzzy. How are you deciding what metrics to use and how is Salesforce thinking about reporting and disclosure standards? A uh, big question. I, I guess on the on our Trillion Tree initiative, it's it's fairly simple. We we hold ourselves accountable to our pledge. Um, we, like we like I said earlier, we had a hundred million tree pledge, and we have all of our projects put polygons, uh, so we can track the forest over time. Um, and the broader one t dot org initiative is also kind of working on how to hold pledges accountable <clears throat> for our own. Um, net zero journey, which we're on, we follow the basic rules, which is we need to do our emission inventory very well at the highest standard we possibly can. We need to be very transparent about that with some of the groups here. We have to have a target that's aggressive, that's public, that's backed up with um, decarbonization plans. So we've actually built up our decarbonization team. As a software company, we love to build tools that others can follow. So we actually have a software that helps companies measure emissions, shares decarbonization tools. Um, and recently, we've launched a new, a new marketplace where people can kind of find high quality credit. So um, that's part of, part of holding ourselves accountable is um, making we sure we follow a lot of the rubrics that we've heard here um, to kind of follow that mitigation hierarchy pathway. Um, and then putting data in a place where people can actually use it. That's one of Salesforce's superpower. Um, it's like bringing all the data in so you have a 360 vision of what's in front of you and what you need to do. So um, we continue to challenge ourselves for what kind of products uh, public institutions or private companies need and, um, and make it visible and actionable. Yeah. And, that, and that's in reference to the CO2 platform that you've just launched, John. Yeah, the net zero marketplace, yeah, which has gone out. And that's just a place where we're bringing, you know, it, it's very funny. If, if you ask someone, where's the carbon market? Um, it's hard to sort of understand where a market is. So um, it is a new product that we've launched where we're just hoping, um, I think it's only like a 1% facilitation fee. I don't think it's something we're looking to make money on. We really want to bring market players. We've got 100 projects from five project developers, tens of millions of tons, plus the ratings agencies. Um, there's some great new groups out there, Silvera and Calix, that are bringing a lot of transparency to the quality of the project. So for the first time, it's all in one spot. 
and uh, companies can go there and just sort of figure out what other uh, quality rating organizations have said and also see transparency on the price and the volume and the contracts and things like that. Thanks, John. So we heard before, Scarlett, that the SPTI started with the Paris and the demand from the private sector to be accountable. So that's now eight, almost eight years ago. Things have moved. You've got a hockey stick growth of, of members into the thousands. What are they telling you now about what they want to be transparent about and where science-based targets working in perhaps other areas that are not pure climate? What, what are the companies saying, do you mean? No, what, what are you doing? What, is what are we doing? What is, what is the SB? Yeah, yes. I mean, there's two, maybe two things to talk about. So the first one is what I've been brought into SBTI to do, which is this piece around beyond value chain mitigation. Um, so in the net zero standard, companies have to have near-term targets. They have to have long-term targets um, before 2050. And those targets are value chain targets. So within their own businesses and their own value chain supply chains and, and downstream as well. Um, and then whatever is left, there are going to be some sectors that have residual emissions. Um, and if you're taking the all company pathway, you have to get to a 90% reduction by 2050 under the SBTI standard. And then you can remove the remaining 10%. And at that point, once you've removed them, you can claim that you have achieved net zero. So many companies won't be able to achieve net zero under the SBTI standard for many years because we have a long journey ahead of us in terms of decarbonizing. Now, very importantly, SBTI strongly recommends that as a company transitions, it also um, engages in beyond value chain mitigation. So this is essentially channeling finance into mitigation activities beyond their supply chains or operations. For example, it could be investing into intact forests or jurisdictional red plus, or it could be investing into direct air capture and storage to you know, bring down the costs of some of the removal technologies that we know that we're gonna need in the future. And so, um, you know, this definition of beyond value chain mitigation, it includes removals and it also includes reductions. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's really important because even if every company in the world sets science-based targets, which I don't believe they will in the absence of regulation, um, we still wouldn't get to 1.5 degrees because there are many emissions that sit outside of the value chains of companies. Now, yes, com corp um, governments have a role there, but you know the private sector has a lot of the capital, um, and I think really does have a responsibility to um, contribute to additional mitigation outside of their value chains. They are still, you know, even if a company is setting a science-based target, is reducing its emissions each year, um, there are still emissions that they are putting into the atmosphere, which are causing warming. Um, and so we really want to understand as SBTI how we can incentivize companies to make these additional investments. Um, and maybe just on the nature thing. So um, we are also, and th it's a little bit confusing, but there's the science-based target initiative is working on climate, and there's the science-based target network, which is broader and is also trying to, in addition to climate, bring in some of these other nature goals. So there's a freshwater hub, a land hub, which is looking at terrestrial eutrophication, biodiversity, et cetera, um, a, an oceans hub, um, freshwater, oceans, biodiversity, and land, those four hubs. Um, and so we are, I'm working on the land hub, so helping develop the land nature targets. Um, the freshwater guidance is, is out for public consultation, it actually closed um, a couple of weeks ago, um, but companies can essentially already set um, freshwater science-based targets using that draft. Um, and then, yeah, the V1, version one of the land targets are gonna be coming out in Q1 next year. So, um, with maybe just to say with nature, it is um, a whole host, uh, like just orders of magnitude more complicated. We don't have 1.5 degree equivalent. We don't have a global agreed goal. We have, we don't just have one metric, which is carbon dioxide equivalent. We don't have the greenhouse gas protocol. You know, we, so much of the infrastructure that we've had in place with climate and allowed SBTI to really grow as quickly as it did ha isn't in place for nature. So um, 
be patient, but it's coming. <laughs> Thanks very much, Scarlett. And of course, the Jeff is a very proud supporter of the Science Based Targets Network, and we're one of the uh, anchor investors um, in the initiative. I'd like to thank all of our participants for, for joining us, and we just have time for one or two questions, I think, if there's any way that the people dialing in know they can't ask, ask questions, but perhaps from our audience here, if there are any questions. If you could tell the audience who you are and uh, your question, please. Thank you. Uh, to briefly introduce myself, my name is Tai Yang. Uh, I'm also one of the Global Youth Ambassador from Gauk, as Karen is. And also, I'm very glad to see Karen, our very excellent Youth Ambassador, has been included into this very important dialogue. So my question is regarding the youth representativeness um, in the global climate governance process, because I can actually see that um, uh, our voices sometimes are being heard but sometimes our perspectives would not be, be taken by the global leaders. Like, especially when the time we feel really helpless to see that the global leaders, uh, their words from a bunch of 70 years old guys, can decide the future of our planet, the future of our generation. And they will never reach this satisfactory enough agreements and responsible enough for the next generation. So I'm quite interested about um, how will you respond to our demand? How will you enhance or advance the youth represent representation in your partnerships? And um, yeah, so maybe this question is for all panelists, except for Karen, because I know Gauk is a 100% youth-oriented and youth-led organization. Thank you. Such a wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking that. How are we engaging youth? I can, I can yeah. For, first of all, thank you for, for, for the question. You know, I am like in the border between the young and not so young. And um, just to tell you on a city level what has happened, because believe it or not, all this movement of youth and on the Greta Thunberg movement, the climate emergency, this really we have seen in ICLE that has really driven action from local governments too. So of course you are calling for national mm, governments and so, but the role that local governments have now is really being pushed because, and thanks to the youth um, pushing, really, because uh, the youth, you are going outside the municipalities, you know, so it, it's, it's not only outside the central government, but also outside the municipalities. And just in response to that, because we noticed this in ICLE, a, a couple of years ago already and in fact we have a whole initiative now on youth uh, involvement and youth um, engagement in order to foster and accelerate climate action on a, on, a, on a local level also because mayors we also have old mayors <laughs> but um, and we really see that uh, with this pressure from the young community they are really starting to act more so on my side and I think that from the ICLE team we are happy that this movement is 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 really running and we can see the results on the uh, mayor's commitments to be more carbon neutral more resilient engaging in more initiatives so we are really glad that this movement is can I add something I I, I really want to thank you for this question this is a very important one we could generalize to other but I wanted to emphasize when you look at companies we're ultimately we're talking about companies transforming their business model, transform the way they source their ingredients, they produce their ingredients, they sell their ingredients. Like we're, we're talking about this when we're talking also about decarbonization. And I think I'm ultimately convinced that when you're looking at company structure, there are two sets of people that will be able to change them. One at the top because they have the power dynamic and the ones that are the young people that just arrived because they have the conviction, the mindset, the, the, the energy. And unfortunately, those that are in the middle for me can't because they have already started the walking up the ladder and they want to become the new boss. And so they're tied and they won't. And so I, and, and this is why I think more and more, I think some very uh, transformative CEOs are seeing this. I, I, you can see more and more CEOs setting up youth boards, but there we need to have more than that. I know Schneider Electric is one of those companies that is very, very much engaged in that. And, but we need more. And I think uh, this is a very good question you should ask. And then, of course, there are many other ones because 
uh, you need to represent also what are for me, for me a good question is how can you represent more farmers in your in your in the work that you're doing and civil society in general when you're, you're looking at research for example how can civil society needs be more at the, uh, more represented so thank you for the question a very important one yeah maybe just to add I, mean, I totally agree and I think also the youth like when when we're thinking about what is the business case for getting companies to go above and beyond science-based targets the business case is future consumers and that's the youth so you know, I think they have a huge role. Um, and I also hope that I'm not too old myself as well. <laughs> well, please give all of our panelists a round of applause. Thank you so much uh, for, for the audience to join us today as well. Thank you. Thank you.